Julia Garner has been cast as the Silver Surfer in the Fantastic Four film. Warner Brothers is making a fifth Matrix movie. Plus, The Mummy and Alien are getting re-releases on April 26th this month. Let's get into this week's movie news. What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. There's a lot to get into this week on movie news. A bunch of new announcements, movie trailers, and castings. But let's get into that box office. Which was pretty healthy, even though uh, this year has been pretty low in terms of the last 20 years. I think it's the worst box office or lowest for the first quarter since 2001, I believe. I think even 2020 did better before COVID happened. And that's with the help of Dune, Godzilla, and even the tail end of Wonka really inflating the box office numbers this year. So it hasn't been overall a great first quarter, but it's been a pretty good weekend because Godzilla is still at top. Godzilla X Kong with $29 million at the domestic box office. It broke $200 million globally in its first weekend, I believe. Yes. It's just an absolute banger. Everyone's going to see this. People love the MonsterVerse. They love Kong. They love Godzilla. I had a good time with this film. We did a review of it. My only one con to it really is there's not a lot of Godzilla in it. He only had six minutes of screen time, I think. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. It wasn't exactly a Godzilla X Kong movie. It was a Kong with a little bit of sprinkle of, of Godzilla movie. <laughs> a little garnish of Godzilla. It was basically Planet of the Apes with a giant with Kong, lizard. With Kong. Yeah, the, <laughs> some giant lizard came to chill. He was just taking lots of naps and, and charging up for the whole movie. It's basically if you had a, an iPhone with a dying battery, you just got to keep charging it. was Godzilla. Got to keep charging it constantly. New pink phone case. <laughs> but I enjoyed that film. But obviously, we know Godzilla. Kong and MonsterVerse movies decimate the box office globally, so it's just a huge hit already. Speaking of monkeys, Monkey Man <laughs> actually came out in second place with its debut weekend from director Deb Patel. It earned $10.5 million at the domestic weekend box office, which is a really good sign. Universal bought this film from Netflix for $10 million, so after next week, they'll have be make, they'll be making money on it. I have a little tidbit about what exactly happened. Jordan Peele revealed what, what in Dev Patel revealed what was going on with so, the production of it yeah so Dev Patel made the movie for Netflix for 30 million dollars because I remember we talked about that a, yeah. like a couple of years ago on movie news yeah so Monkey Man was produced by Netflix for 30 million dollars and Dev Patel finished the film and Netflix was not happy with it so they actually shelved it and they weren't going to release it on Netflix at all so it was just basically going to be uh, a, a dead movie and Jordan Peele heard about this watched the film And after watching the film, he loved it, and he called up Dev Patel, asked him to film in on everything that happened. Dev Patel told him the whole story, how how Netflix didn't want to release it anymore. And so um, because of his connections and deal with Universal, all of his films have been Universal films, Jordan Peele convinced Universal to buy the film from Netflix for $10 million. And so Universal basically got a great movie, a really fun action movie, that they didn't have to, they didn't even make. They just bought the movie for ten million dollars from Netflix, which wasn't going to do anything with it. So, uh, they they didn't have to spend much money on this movie at all. Universal is going to definitely be in the green very soon. And we had a lot of fun with this film. It's a great action movie. Dev Patel knocked it out of the park. If you haven't seen Monkey Man, you love action movies. This is definitely one to watch this weekend. And we'll get into Netflix later on with how much money they're just letting on fire without any return on investment and what it's led to. So we'll get into that news in a little bit. But Ghostbusters in third place. The Frozen Empire. Frozen. Frozen. It's cold in there. $9 million at the domestic box office. It's cold in here. We had the first Omen, which was its opening weekend. Yes. This past weekend, it pulled $8 million at the domestic box office on a $30 million budget. I'm sure it'll hit that mark at some point because it's a horror film. They were hoping for more, though. They're hoping for closer to $15 to $20 million for a horror movie. A recognizable property and name they were expecting a little bit more. I feel like there's already been a first Omen. I don't know. It's just like... (laughs) There's been several Omen movies, but remember, The Exorcist Believer, the other prequel horror film of a famous IP last year, performed very poorly. So I think that prequels of well-known IPs is not something audiences are really that interested in. Especially... No, no, the, the new Exorcist Believer was a successful film. Was it? Yeah. How much did it make? It made like... I'm pretty sure it made... Pretty close to $100 million at the box office. No way. Hold on, let me check. Holy it was a, it was a profitable film. The, although the first Almond is playing everywhere around the world, so it should make some decent money. But they were definitely hoping for closer to $15 million for its opening weekend. $137 million at the box office. Jesus, never mind. That yeah. movie did really well. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, man. You are misinformed or uninformed. I guess I'm misinformed. Fake news. Fake news. Anthony's spreading disinformation around here. What's not disinformation is that Kung Fu Panda is in fifth place this week with... $8 million in its third weekend. And then Dune Part 2 
sixth place with $6.7 million, closing in on $700 million globally. I contributed to that this past week. <laughs> it's almost there. Then Someone Like You came out in eighth place with $4 million in its opening debut. Arthur the King next up with $1.8 million, still chugging along. Immaculate, $1.5 million. It's brought its total to $14 million, which is about the budget of the movie, if I remember correctly. And then Wicked Little Letters which debuted with $1.2 million to round out the top box office this weekend. So, Immaculate, so Immaculate's up to actually $17 million at the global box office. Okay, so it's doing I okay. It's make more, but I'm sure it'll have a, a keep going. It's making a consistent like quarter mil a day. I think that they're slowly rolling it out to more markets globally because it's not in that many markets globally. Whereas the first omen is going to be playing wide everywhere. It's only a $9 million budget, so it's probably in the green right now at yeah. $17 million. So I would say that it's already a successful film. It's praying for success. It's making money back. It's got a return on investments. And then... Nuns bringing the money. Nuns. When you go to the church, they're like, hey, give us some of that money. <laughs> give us some money with these baskets. Let's get into uh, the movie news. So this week... We have CinemaCon is happening. All the biggest studios will be there talking about upcoming projects, releases. Some trailers will be dropped. Some of it will be secretive, so you only hear about it. Some of it will get released to the public. CinemaCon is always an exciting part of the year. And I'm sure Movie News next week will be stacked with tons stacked. of new intelligence from the film and TV community. Film Intel. Film Intel. I like it. And <laughs> uh, however, I heard, I believe Sony... Columbia Pictures will not be at CinemaCon this year. Oh, wow. But everyone else will be there. Paramount will be there. Warner Brothers, Legendary, I'm sure. And I, everyone probably wanted to go for Spider-Man content, but <laughs> now they're not getting any. <laughs> and then I God know damn it! there's going to be a James Cameron exhibit for the art of James Cameron going. I'm, there's a big exhibit about all of his movies, mm -hmm. which would be cool if you're attending. I would definitely check that out if I was you. Now, the one of the biggest stories of the week is Fantastic Four. Two bits of news. First of all, Julia Garner has been cast as the Silver Surfer in this adaptation of the property. And remember, the Silver Surfer was the villain of the second Fantastic Four in like 2007, mm -hmm. which was not a good movie. And also, we got a poster, a solo poster for the Human Torch will be played by Joseph Quinn, obviously. But this torch, this poster is very in style of that sort of greeting card they released on Valentine's yeah, it's Day. illustration, yeah. So it's this retro cartoon drawing and it looks cool yeah. i'm still very curious about this film i'm holding my breath on it because they are still yet to i think make a solid a good fantastic four actually i don't hate the original but i'm sure if i watched it now i probably wouldn't like it that much. we liked it as kids but i'm sure it's not as good as i haven't remember. seen it since didn't love the reboot they did with miles teller and michael b jordan but oh, I, I, I always forget about that yeah, but i think i think they could have something on their hands here this cast is getting better and better by the day and I can't wait. I wonder if Silver Surfer will be the main antagonist of the film or if there'll be another one. Maybe a couple antagonists like they usually do in Marvel movies. Maybe they'll set up Doom. That'd be pretty cool. Maybe they'll set him up. That'd be pretty cool. They, that's my guess with that film. I think they will because I think Doom will be the main villain once they connect the MCU and X-Men and everyone together. Without Kang, they'll be the replacement. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Doom might be the big, big bad, the next Thanos going forward. Probably. We'll Should see. be. That'd we'll be a see. good pick. Be a good pick. And who would you get to play him? Um, someone cool as fuck. That's who you would get. <laughs> That's who you would get. So, there's some news. You all asked for this. I really don't want to bring this up. We all, but especially after last year, we begged for this. Warner Brothers are making a new Matrix film. Yay. Another Matrix film. Yay. This will be a fifth film in the Matrix universe. Drew Goddard is set to write and direct. He wrote The Martian, The Cabin in the Woods. Cloverfield, World War Z. He's an excellent screenwriter. Has he directed a film or is this his debut? I'm not 100% sure. I believe he directed The Cabin in the Woods. Okay, so if he directed yes. The Cabin in the Woods. He's a really solid filmmaker. I mean, those are some movies that I really like. And The Martian's an excellent script. So is in Cabin in the Woods. But do we need another Matrix movie? Probably not. But apparently he brought a new idea and a new pitch to Warner Brothers that they liked a lot. So we are getting a fifth Matrix movie, whether we like it or not. And <laughs> we will... Be in the cinema to see it, obviously, but mixed feelings about this. But who knows? It could be cool. And again, this is the landscape we live in. It's just going to be our whole lives are going to be filled with reboots, sequels, legacy sequels, which has kind of always happened in cinema, especially in the 20th century with monster movies, yeah, science fiction movies. It is what it is. I think at this point, we all just have to start accepting it, which sucks. But at the same time, 
We can't control it. We have no control of this. Yeah. We just have to we just have to see them and enjoy it. Hoping hopefully they're good. So Drew Goddard also directed Bad Times at the El Royale, which was kind of a step down from the great sensational Cabin in the Woods, but he's also been a writer and producer of the Daredevil T V series. The and Netflix co- and, one and created it, helped create it for the screen. So for, I mean he's a great filmmaker, yeah. clearly. We'll see what he's got. World War Z is good, and he wrote a ton of episodes on Lost, and he wrote Cloverfield. Well, the good news about it is there's no way it can be as bad as Resurrections. <laughs> there's no way that's possible. Like like okay, they... I say if you're going to do another remake Matrix movie, just new characters. Completely new characters. Just, just do a new thing. No Neo. Yeah. And go back to the roots. Go back to the roots. Maybe, maybe it'll be a, maybe it'll be an origin of the war of humanity versus machines. Matrix Origins. Which would be pretty interesting. Maybe it's about the first people to plug in. Yeah. Plug it in, plug it in. Drew Goddard's listening like, oh my god, that's my idea. How do you this find out? That's a great out? idea, guys. <laughs> is he log- Did he hack my computer? Keep talking, guys. Keep talking. <laughs> that's what I would do. If I was going to make a new Matrix movie, I'd go back to the war. Well, you could do the first one. Yeah, the original could. one. But I would do the war on Earth. Yeah. I would go on Earth, but then also plugging in for the first times to experiment to see if you can hack the system. Yeah. I think the, the movie would, should end with... No, yeah. Like a the, war with the first hackers yeah. of going into the Matrix, uh-huh. both at the same time, while they're being pushed underground by the machines. But the original one woke up the first people. Yeah. So we get you got to get the original one in there. You don't have to. I would do the war. Yeah. You're like, war! No, I think it'd be cool. Yeah, but you need to have the program. I know the program's already being created to an uh-huh. extent. Yeah. So, okay, so... So remember what Morpheus says. He says uh, there was a, a person born within the Matrix. He, he yeah, yeah, the no. first one, and they, the movie. they woke the first of us up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happens is <laughs> Morpheus gives Neo a choice, the red pill or the blue pill. I'm throw my laptop off your face and ruin this episode. <laughs> Anyways, that's how I would, I would do a war. Anthony would do the first cycle of the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the next bit of movies. <laughs> Warner Brothers. I'm honestly, I, I don't, I, I don't know. But um, this is some good news, though. Dune three, Dune Messiah has officially been confirmed, officially as in development from Legendary Pictures. But we knew this was going to happen because yeah. Denise said last week that they're almost done with the script, mm-hmm. and at some point it's going to get made if it gets greenlit. But it's pulling. You really think Denise would write a screenplay and Legendary would be like, no, we don't really feel like <laughs> doing it. No! You really still on this Dune thing, bro? <laughs> Dune Part Two is cool, but get, o- get over it, Denis. Get over it. <laughs> and Legendary, obviously a great production company, will be producing that with him. So that's awesome news. We all saw it coming. We have no idea when it's gonna get made. I'm sure they'll probably do a little time lapse. So maybe, maybe five years. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Because I think Denis is gonna do a movie before that. Also, we have a great Denis Villeneuve episode for you on Wednesday. So stay tuned for that. We did a whole director career breakdown of Denis Villeneuve. He was here. I'm just kidding. He wasn't. <laughs> we should advertise him as that. <laughs> In- interview with Denis Villeneuve. I can make a thumbnail of him sitting in our set. <laughs> All right. We have a couple of cool bits of information here about two re-releases to cinemas this this year, this month. On April 26th, for limited releases, we'll get the 25th anniversary, the return of The Mummy. Starring oh, yeah. Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz, the iconic film that we all love so, so much. And we'll be doing an episode on The Mummy. Hell yeah. For you that, bet your ass for that we'll weekend. Be sitting in theaters for that. As well as a re release of the all time Alien from Ridley Scott, also hitting theaters for a limited release on April 26th. Fox for Universal. So, the how, showdown. Is it me or all the studios listen to us? Because out of nowhere, in the last six months, so many announcements of re releases in theaters. This all just started this year. I know it's going to be a drought in Hollywood this year. There's not a ton coming out this year. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, we've been talking about this for years, saying that movies studios should just re-release their movies consistently. Absolutely. Every month have a new, have an old movie come out. Why they, not? It's free money. Guys, just pay, just pay us for our insights that you at t- least, clearly yeah. pull from us. Listen, studios, yeah, at least next time, let us give us some credit. Yeah. It's like when someone reposts our videos and they <laughs> give us the at Raiders of Lost podcast. <laughs> give us a little credit for that. Dude, some people are sneaky. They'll do it in their stories, and it's like they make it seem like they made the meme. I hate that shit. Unreal. All right, want to get into the next bit of Alien? Movies? Well, to stay on Alien, yeah. yeah. So, Alien Romulus, which is coming out very soon, released an image. We've gotten a teaser trailer. We've got a poster, but now we got a still, and it's just a still of closed doors, which I'm guessing are probably on the ship that the characters are on and the film takes place on, and it says Romulus Labs, and there's a, a, a drawing of a lion, it looks like, on it too, etched into the doors, so 
Sounds pretty cool. Some obviously probably experimentation going on this vessel as it's traveling through space is my guess. But I'm very curious to see what this means and what Romulus is, what the Romulus program is in the world of Alien. I bet it has something to do with Xenomorphs. Probably. It's also a W on the door. W. For Wayland. Wayland Utani. I bet there's a Xenomorph behind that door. I hope so. Speaking of images, Joker 2 released its official first poster. And it's really great. It's just exactly what I was expecting, honestly. It's... Uh, Joker and Harley Quinn in this like beautiful musical backlit uh, spotlight behind them. And he's holding her like they're dancing. So I expected something like this. Got a big mixed response online because people are like saying it looks too much like the letterbox posters of where it's the bottom third of the frame. Oh, the yeah. Subject is. Yeah. When people look at the top. Yeah. So I think it's cool. I'm very excited about this. Anthony and I have been on board for Joker 2 since it was announced. And we are very hyped for this. We believe in Todd Phillips and Joaquin Phoenix and Lady Gaga to deliver an excellent sequel to really a sensational film. But people who are critical of the poster, they ref they forget that the original Joker poster did that. Yeah, with, it's true. With Joaquin so, okay, just yeah, on the bottom of the frame. It's actually exactly like the original it's, poster. It's uh, literally like a, 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 it builds off of the first poster they released of So Joker. the letterboxed posters that fans made with the lower thirds of just the characters, then a ton of space in the center, and then the title at the top was... Yeah. Looks like it was inspired by the Joker poster from 2017. Yeah. I remember that. Up. Yeah, they in Joaquin's on the bottom of the frame with him dancing. That was one of the early posters they released. So good looks. All the critics get your facts straight. Just like y'all are upset that it's a musical when there's freaking four musical numbers in Joker. And um, this movie makes it really known that this is a musical. This is this is a great poster. I think. It's and there really was a cool. release of Har of Lady Gaga. Was she singing or speaking? Some audio was released recently. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't want to listen to it. I, I want to. Little... We're going to be getting a trailer soon. That's definitely going to happen sometime this week if we just got this poster. I'm very excited. Speaking of an upcoming trailer, so tomorrow, from May 24, Maxine's first trailer will be dropping, finally. They put out a little tease on Twitter, and uh, the world's very excited, obviously. The year of Ty West continues. It never ends. Into 2024. The year of Ty West never ends. <laughs> I can't wait to see Maxine. I am very excited for this film. I'm really curious to see what they have uh, put together for this film. Nice. Yeah. I'm also very curious about Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Now, I saw Dune Part 2 for the third time this past week. I went to 70 mil IMAX to the Universal City Walks, the fucking sickest theater. And before the movie played, after all the main trailers, there was a sneak peek of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. I'm sure some of you experienced this as well if you saw Dune 2 in theaters this past week. And it was about a minute-long portion of a scene. And it looked really cool. And I also found out that this film was almost entirely shot on location. I read that there was just only one blue screen set. And you can tell from the filmmaking when, when I saw this clip. And so it looks really cool. It was uh, just one of the main characters, the, the young woman who seems to be the lead in the film, besides the apes, is being rescued by Caesar's descendant from some villainous apes and gorillas. And... The filmmaking looks awesome, and I'm pretty excited about this. Very curious, and especially hearing that the whole entire film basically was shot on location. That's awesome news. And Wes Ball, the director, he's he's a solid director. He did the Maze Runner series, and um, those are well executed. And I didn't realize he was the guy who did this. Remember, it was 15 years ago almost. There was this dystopian sh animated short, and it was about this guy on a motorcycle with like a, a bandana on. And he was like driving through and he gets chased by like a futuristic helicopter. It's oh, yeah, called, I remember that. Ruin. Yeah. It, it like blew up online. It yeah. got like 30 million views on YouTube because nobody had seen like a animated short like that before because it's very high quality. And he just built like a world. That was, he made that on his own. He's like a visual effects CGI expert. And he made that short film. That's what got him the Maze Runner gig. And I totally forgot that about that short until I looked into him. And it's called Ruin. If you haven't seen it, it's a really fun sci-fi short completely cgi animated that he did entirely himself um i think with also with this uh, tiny team but it showed his prowess with cgi and visual effects and that's what got him maze runner that's what blew him up that's like gareth edwards yeah with monsters right yeah exactly he made monsters that's a cool movie yeah. he did all the visual effects for it but um it's cool check, check it out west ball is a talented guy so i think he was the right choice for this film it looks like a really good trailer to me i think it's gonna be sick
We got some more news about Denis Villeneuve because we can't stop talking about this guy. Oh, man. He's in talks to direct Nuclear War, a scenario. Now, in our episode on Wednesday, you'll hear us talk about all the rumored projects he's supposedly directing. There's one that's Cleopatra film that's supposedly starring Zendaya. There's a science fiction space film that he might be making. This is one that's new news, but it's not official. He's just in talks to produce, possibly direct Nuclear War, a scenario which is based off a book. It follows the events of... What would happen if a nuclear war began based on information from interviews with military and civilian experts? So, I mean, if Denise is going to make a movie, we will be seated day one, obviously. But it's not confirmed. I think, obviously, he's probably the hottest director in the world right now. He can do anything he wants. So hot right now. So I'm sure he's taking his time. You know, they just finished up the press tour for Dune Part 2. It's still in theaters. So I'm sure he wants to, you know, figure it out. He's got his plans. I'm, I'm sure he probably knows. But... They don't like to announce these things right away, but he's in talks to direct three different movies. I don't know which one it's going to be. It sounds like it's um could be in the vein of World War Z of like getting a realistic response globally of a zombie outbreak, but this time it's a nuclear war and similar to a civil war from A24 of like what would have... I think that it's like what would it look like if it happened realistically, true, logistically. And speaking of civil war, A24, which in this film's coming out very soon, A24 dropped... The official map of territories for Civil War, so you can understand how the country is split and divided itself. So there are several factions. So first we have the Western Forces, with the which is the northwest look area of the country, for all the way from Washington to Missouri. And then there's the Republic of California and the Second Republic of Texas, which are allies. And then the Loyalist States, which are most of the middle states running from the west to Nevada all the way up to the uh, the northeast into Maine. And then we have the Florida Alliance, which is most of the southwest, southeast of the country, including Florida, obviously. So there are these different factions, and it looks like the Western forces and Florida alliances are separating themselves from America, whereas the loyalist states, which will be, like I said, the middle states from west to east, are still loyal to the old America. And then Republic of California and Republic of Texas have divided and joined forces. Yeah, so— there are four, yeah, so I, I got a little confused with the way you said that. Oh, so there's, sorry. There's yeah. four factions. Western forces are California and Texas. They're together. New People's Army, that is the northwest of the United States. So all the way from, it looks like, Illinois, or, or what's next to Illinois? Um, so like Wyoming all the way to Washington. And then the loyal states, like Anthony says, central United States, all the way to the East Coast, all the way to New England, as well as some of... Uh, looks like Georgia, West Virginia, as well as Arizona, Nevada. And then Florida Alliance is its own faction. Florida Alliance is Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, it looks like, as well as North Dakota, Idaho, some of those other states right there. So there are four factions total in Civil War. We're going to see it tomorrow night at IMAX, the TCL Theater in Hollywood, which is a tremendous theater. <laughs> Cannot wait. Very excited about this because I'm so curious about this film. Poor little Alaska... Looks like they're not even involved. <laughs> You're or right. Hawaii. I, Alaska um, and Hawaii no, aren't involved at all. Alaska is a loyalist. Loyalist. They're loyalist states. Are they? Both of them. They're, I got the, the uh, larger map. Okay, cool. So they're both with the loyalist states color. Copy. And I'm sure we'll hear more about it in the film. Specifically. It, yeah, it looks like the largest faction is the loyalist states because it goes all the way from Maine, New England, all the way to Illinois, across the center of the United States, all the way to Arizona, Nevada. But when you talk about population Oregon. size, California and Texas probably takes the cake. Maybe, probably. For size it's, of, it's, it's possible. Yeah, size of the population. You know, that's probably 75 million people combined. Yeah. So, very curious. A little more information about this film. They also released a clip online, which I did not watch because I don't like to watch clips of films anymore. But we'll be seeing it on Monday, and we'll give you our thoughts. Maybe we'll do an episode on it. And it's projected to have, I think, was it 25? 25. Million box office, and this is A24's most expensive film to date at a budget of about ninety million. I think it yes, was sir. eighty or ninety million dollars. Mil. So probably one hundred fifty million dollars spent on this. It's got, film. it's got a very heavy marketing campaign, yeah, once, so you yeah, can expect quite a bit. They've been marketing about the forty million. Of so that's a big they, A24 they, film this year. They they want to try and make two hundred fifty million. Yeah, that's, that's their goal. We'll with see that, with that money they're spending. We will see. We will see. We'll see if an A24 movie can pull that much. Yeah. Um, Netflix news. So we talked about this earlier, how they scrapped Monkey Man. Then it was bought by Universal with the help of Jordan Peele, which is why he's one of the producers on the film. Mm -hmm. And Netflix has a new film head. His name's Dan Lin. 
He told leadership recently that their past output of films were not great. And the financials, <laughs> the financials didn't add up. And I'm with you, Dan. With you. I'm with you, pal. I haven't been loving the majority of Netflix's original releases lately. And I mean, when you're spending crazy amounts of money with no return on investment, really, besides subscriptions, which is kind of hard to gauge if you're making money back on a movie. It's almost impossible to gauge that. Is it worth it? Are you spending the money in the right places? Are you inflating budgets just to make movies look good? Is it the easy way out? And I think a lot of studios are starting to learn and wise up to they've been spending way too much money on films that aren't getting enough return on investment. And when you have a streaming platform like Netflix and you're not releasing most of your movies in theaters and you're dependent on subscriptions, how much money can you actually make and how long can you output films of this high of a budget? So I'm happy to hear that I believe there's only a couple of films at Netflix that are in production right now versus usually there's like 10. Yeah, they used to be like the attitude of like, oh, we're a new movie every other week, kind of. It was, it was pretty yeah. nuts for a while. So we have a new head of film at Netflix. Hopefully he leads them in a better direction going forward with their film. Dan's going to clean it up. Let's go, Dan. You got, got this, Dan. We got faith in you, pal. All right, next up, we have some Star Wars news. So James Mangold, obviously, as we've talked about, is developing his own Star Wars movie called Star Wars Dawn of the Jedi. They finally found a writer, and it's a very strong choice for a writer, Bo Willimon, who was the creator and showrunner of House of Cards, an extremely talented writer. House of Cards for several years was one of the best written shows uh, on air at First the time. First two seasons of that yeah. show, oh my gosh, magnificent TV. He's also a playwright, but he's a fantastic writer, and I think this is an excellent choice. You're picking someone with an extreme amount of experience, a great amount of success dependent on their writing. And I think that if you're going to go for cat hiring someone to write your film, doing someone like this is a great option, honestly. I think this is a great pairing, Mangold and Bo Willimon. And he must have had a great pitch to help with uh, Mangold's vision. So I look forward to this. Bo Willimon, extremely talented guy. So I bet this goes into production maybe next year probably. I would say so, yeah. Because Mangold's going to be busy with the Bob Dylan film. He's still filming right now. Yeah. So I bet you next year maybe we'll start production. Then maybe we can get it by 2026. Yeah, I, I'm I'm sure Willimon's going to be working on the script for a few months, and so they'll probably start pre-production late la late next yeah. this year and then start production early next year. I think Disney's really dropped the ball. They haven't had a Star Wars movie in theaters in freaking eight years. 2019? When did Last Jedi? Rise, I mean, Rise Skywalker. of Skywalker. Was that 2019 or yeah. 2017? 2019. Was it that? No, it wasn't 2019. Was it? Yeah. Let me check. 2019. Rise of Skywalker. 2018 wow, 2019. Or, yeah, 2019. Still, five years without a Star Wars film in theaters. It's a long time. What's the, the long point of have? Time. What's the point of buying that IP? Just make a bunch of TV shows. Oh, wait, no Solo did Star... Oh, wait, no, Han Solo came up before that. Oh, yeah, that was like 2014. Yeah. That was a while ago. That was like eight years ago, man. <laughs> people don't forget... Well, people forgot Solo, <laughs> Star Wars story. <laughs> they forgot that real quick. All right, so that's good news. We have some more news about the Supergirl film. It has found a director in Craig... Gillespie, who is a great director, he made I, Tonya, which is a terrific movie, and then Cruella. So he'll Cruella? Cruella. <laughs> I was Cru like, My name is Cruella de Vil. I hope you wouldn't pick up on that. I was, I was like, <laughs> while I said it, I'm like, did it sound like a W? It probably did. I am eight years old Cruella. So Cruella, <laughs> the Cruella, the Cruella director, <laughs> will be handling the duties on this DCU project. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's just DC project, not DCU, right? Well, it's the DCU now. No, it all it used to be the DCEU. Yeah, and now it's the now DC it's the fuck DCU. you. Yes. <laughs> it's the DC. Uh, <laughs> get it? Staying on comic books, Daredevil: Born Again released an image shared an by image shared by John Bernthal. It's a behind the scenes photos of him with Charlie Cox and Deborah Ann Wall. And there's also a shot of both him and Charlie Cox in character and costumes, which looks really cool. Uh, so it's cool to see Daredevil with the Punisher. Yeah, I think they're really desperate to get people back on board because people love Daredevil, the TV show from Netflix. And this is a show that wasn't it in production and they're they're redoing. They it? filmed six episodes yeah, last they filmed year. Six episodes they shut last it down. year. They shut it down, so they're redoing the whole show again because yeah. it was probably they not did a, great. They did a reset. Remember, they said that people who saw the film. People who were involved in the production said that Daredevil didn't show up in costume until the fourth episode. Which is insane. Yeah. And so, with this show, clearly, they're giving fans what they want. People just want to see 
Daredevil and Punisher bust heads. That's all they that's want. That's all we want. We don't need some fucking courtroom drama bullshit. That's all we Obviously, want. he's a lawyer, so you have Sprinkle to have some courtroom. in there. Yeah, but come on. Just give us the busting skulls. That's all we want. Just have them beat the <laughs> shit out of a bunch of guys. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really easy. And girls. We don't discriminate. Have them beat the shit out of guys and girls. Just kidding. Just girls kidding. that deserve it. That deserve it. <laughs> Murderous girls. Strong, <laughs> invented <villainous> killers. <laughs> yeah. They deserve like it. Like a girl that's about to punch a baby, have the partner come in and beat Break her, her nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all we want. It's, it's all we want. It's so easy, guys. Daredevil and the Punisher just fucking cracking skulls. That's it. It's so easy. It. Dude, we could write that show. <laughs> that's no it. problem. That's how I would open the show. <laughs> how is that not the opening scene? How is When they made the show the first time, how is that not the opening of Daredevil fucking up a bunch of bad guys? <laughs> how is that not the opening? <laughs> what, what was the opening? Dude, I don't even want to know. Him, like, walking into a courthouse. I don't need to be the daredevil to stop crime. And he, he like, <laughs> helps a non-dairy frozen yogurt restaurant stay in business. What? <laughs> yeah, that was probably, I guarantee that was the opening scene. Oh, my God. They were getting sued by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Did someone actually put accidentally put milk in the, in the yogurt. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever make that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get on some interesting news. Now, The Bride, a film from Maggie Gyllenhaal, has just released two images with Christian Bale as Frankenstein's monster and Jesse Buckley as the bride of Frankenstein. So this will probably be a Bride of Frankenstein film reboot. It is, yes. And lots of mixed response. People are complaining about, oh, we've seen this movie, uh, another reboot. Frankenstein is one of the most made characters of all time in cinema and TV, so I have no problem with getting more Frankenstein movies. We just had Lisa Frankenstein. We got this. We have Guillermo del Toro's Frankenstein coming out. Yeah. That's the way it's always been, and it's sort of disappeared for the 80s and 90s for the most part, but it seems like monsters are back in a big way, which I'm excited about. I love Frankenstein monster and Frankenstein. The, the lore is incredible. Give me all the Frankenstein movies. I'm cool. I'm fine, but, and the images look really cool. Images look cool. It looks like she's going with a... Uh a new twist on it and it seems like they'll be much more intelligent and stylish because both the bride and the monster they have like interesting outfits and the monster even has tattoos and it looks like the bride has well so Frankenstein's monster Christian Bale's character he's got stapled head yeah. which is cool but then he has his shirt's half open and he has scarring and staples on his chest as well as a tattoo that says hope then Jesse Buckley's character as the bride, her shot, her photo, her still, it looks like her cheeks have blood smatter, splatter tattoos on her face. That's what it looks like. I think that it's either tattoos or it's actual blood, but they made it black for marketing. But, um, you know, Christian Bale wouldn't sign on to something if it, I mean, actually, hold on, he did Thor Love and Thunder. Never mind. Scratch that. What I was well, that, 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 movie that was a changed, paycheck. That movie changed a lot in the edit. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Heard, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, I think if he's gonna do something, it would be a, it's a great project. So I'm. In, but he made Thor for his kids. Yeah, he did that for, for his and kids for the paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he really needs the paycheck, man. He's in no, yeah, three yeah, Batman that's movies. That's true. He's, yeah. <laughs> he's probably yeah. making a five million dollars a year off those movies. Yeah, he's made a lot of money. <laughs> he's, he's done it, and he I'm sure he got paid for trans uh, for um Terminator Salvation. Yeah, probably got like twenty million dollars check yeah, for that movie. Probably got a big paycheck for that one. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm look. I'm curious. I'm curious to see a trailer. Me too. Speaking of trailers, how about the trailer for Cuckoo, starring Hunter Schaefer and- Cuckoo? Cuckoo. <laughs> I made fun of you for this yeah, last yeah. year, didn't I? I said one flew over the cuckoo's nest. This was like two years ago. Yeah. How's it feel, man? It's pretty bad. Cuckoo. Cuckoo. <laughs> New horror film starring Hunter Schaefer and Dan Stevens just finally released its trailer. We got some interesting images and a little tease of it a week ago. And it's about Hunter Schaefer's character, who's a 17-year-old named Gretchen, reluctantly leaves America to live with her father at a resort in the German Alps, plagued by strange noises and bloody visions. She soon discovers a shocking secret that concerns her own family. Sort of looks sort of like an experimental mad scientist horror film theme I, I'm sensing here. It looks great. Yeah, her father yeah. seems to be sort of a bad guy, maybe, maybe yeah. not. So, but it's, it feels like experimentation is going on or something. Turning humans into monsters of some kind even it could even be a vampire movie it looks yeah. like it could be anything but i think the trailer looks very strong because i thought it was visually arresting intriguing and also i don't even know what's going on which is yeah. important and that shot of her she's riding a bicycle in the dark as she's running away from or riding away from the hospital the facility 
and she set, she like feels someone behind her and someone's chasing her in the dark. Yeah, she really doesn't cool. hear them because she has headphones on. Yeah. She sees the shadow with the lights yeah. of the street lights overhead. I thought that was a really cool shot. I think this looks visually stunning. I'm this is in my opinion the best looking horror trailer. This and uh, the Abigail. No, not Abigail. The uh, what was it? What's the vampire ballerina one called? Abigail. Abigail, yes. <laughs> Abigail, that trailer looks great too. <laughs> I saw Abigail trailer in theaters the other day, and it's just it really hits. Really, it's fun. It's exciting. Also stars Dan Stevens. So horror. He's the scream king right scream now. Scream king man. right now. Love this guy. Love him. If love you haven't him. seen the guest, check it out. He's so good in it. So that both those movies look fantastic. They they look like they're primed to be the best horror films of the year. The two of them. Hey Anthony, have you been curious about what Mufasa the Lion King is gonna look like, dude? All I've thought about every day for the last year is Mufasa Origins. Well, good good news for you. They released a still of little little cub Mufasa oh my God. standing on top of a cliff. The first image released in a first look at Mufasa, the Lion King, the origin story of how Mufasa became king, which will hit theaters on December 20th. Oh, he looks very cute. He looks adorable. He does look cute. This movie's going to make a ton of money. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the Lion King remake made $1.6 billion when it came out, something like that. $1.6, $1.7 billion. So one of the biggest Disney hits um, in a very long time. So you bet your ass they're making this movie. Uh, little Mufasa looks cute. Little Mufasa looks cute. Just want to pet him. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Tron Aries has officially picked a release date of October 10th, 2025. You can see the film. Starring Jared Leto, Evan Peters, Greta Lee, Jody Turner-Smith, Jillian Anderson, and Cameron Monaghan. And again, not much is known about Tron Aries, so Aries. I'm very curious about the film. We do have an image that we got about three weeks ago, which looks pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty promising. So I'm excited about this because we love Tron Legacy, so I hope they don't blow it. Let's move on to some more news. we got a bunch of release dates coming up as well as some casting. So The Chair Company is a new HBO series that will be written and starring... Tim Robinson from the great comedy show. Um, what's it called? Uh, fucking. I think you should leave. I think you should leave. Mm-hmm. Three time Emmy winning show. For, he he won three Emmys for that first season of that show or second season of that show. Mm-hmm. So Tim Robinson, who might be the most gift, gift <laughs> meme, video meme person alive right now with his great comedy and his great sequences, his show will be called The Chair Company. And the series will follow a man who finds himself investigating a far-reaching conspiracy after an embarrassing incident at work. Sounds sounds fun. I think he's one of the brightest stars in comedy right now. He's hysterical. He's got his own niche. He's got his own style. He's a really great performer, and I'm curious about the show a lot, and he's hysterical. New casting in Ryan Coogler's upcoming vampire film, Delroy Lindo, has been cast alongside Michael B. Jordan in the film, which is described as a 1930s-era vampire film with Michael B. Jordan playing twins. This is an original screenplay, so I'm really looking forward to seeing this. All right, get ready for a bunch of release dates right now. So first up, we have The Mandalorian and Grogu has been announced to release on May 22nd, 2026 in theaters. They're just going to milk that as hard as they can. Toy Story 5 will release on June 19th, 2026 in theaters a month after The Mandalorian and Grogu. A Real Pain, starring Jesse Eisenberg and Karen Culkin, releases on October 18th. I thought you were saying Grogu is a real pain. (laughs) (laughs) I I was on the Toy Story after that. What are you talking about? (laughs) A Real Pain releases October 18th in theaters. The film follows cousins who travel to Poland after their grandmother dies to see where she came from and end up joining a Holocaust tour. We Live in Time, a love story film starring Florence Pugh and Andrew Garfield, will release in fall. 2024 it's described as the portrait of a marriage and what it means to create a family daredevil born again which has officially wrapped filming will release next year on disney plus night bitch starring amy adams will release on december 6th in theaters this horror thriller follows a man a woman who's convinced that she's turning into a dog interesting a bunch of release dates have been announced for those projects and our final bit of news you asked for it Legally Blonde is getting a spin-off TV series. Finally! <laughs> about time. It's about time, guys. Finally. The Gossip Girl creators Josh Schwartz and Stephanie Savage are developing and showrunning the show. And I'm not going to watch it. It's not my cup of tea. It's too bad. I like Legally Blonde, the movie. But yeah, it's a good movie. Yeah. I mean, does everything have to be a fucking TV show now? TV show spin-off. Again, like I said earlier, we have to get used to this, man. We have to accept it. There's nothing we can do about it. We have no control. 
I can't wait for the Matrix TV spinoff after Matrix 5. Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> All right, well, that wraps movie news this week. Next week, stay tuned for sure. There will be a ton to discuss after CinemaCon this week. Episodes upcoming tomorrow. We have a great episode on the best horror movies you've never seen. Never seen. And then on Wednesday, like we said early in the episode, we have a spotlight on the incredible career of the great, the prodigal son of science fiction, Denis Villeneuve. Sounds like a job for Spotlight. <laughs> spotlight. Spotlight's on it. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Take care and have a wonderful week watching movies. See you next time. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. Notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere. You can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.